Welcome to the Cool Tools Show. I'm Mark Frauenfelder, Editor-in-Chief of Cool Tools, a website of tool recommendations written by our readers. You can find us at cool-tools.org. I'm joined by my co-host, Kevin Kelly, founder of Cool Tools. Hey, Kevin. Hey, it's great to be here. In each episode of the Cool Tools Show, Kevin and I talk to a guest about some of his or her favorite uncommon and uncommonly good tools they think others should know about. Our guest this week is Sanho Tree. Sanho is a fellow at the Institute for Policy Studies, where he has directed its drug policy project since 1998. The project works to end the domestic and international war on drugs and replace it with policies that promote public health and safety. Sanho is also a former military and diplomatic historian and has worked for Harry Belafonte and edited Covert Action Quarterly, a magazine of investigative journalism. I uh, met Sanho, oh man, I probably was close to 10 years ago at uh, the Conference for World Affairs in Boulder, Colorado. And then I followed him on Twitter and found his Twitter uh, stream to be very entertaining and educational and provocative. And uh, I've been a huge fan ever since. So it's a, a real thrill to have you, Sanho. How are you doing? Oh, great. Thanks. The pleasure is mine. <laughs> Yeah, thanks for joining us. We're really looking forward to your um, favorite tools. Sure, yeah. not not going anywhere since we're on lockdown. From <laughs> yeah. The, yeah. Yeah. Exactly, and, so. and uh, uh, appropriately, um, since this coronavirus has a lipid shell that can be easily uh, <laughs> dissolved and attacked with soap, you've got a magnetic soap holder you want to uh, recommend. Yes. One that's dirt cheap also. Incredibly cheap, which is ironic because when I first met you about 10 years ago, I was in Boulder, Colorado, mm -hmm. and we stayed at, uh, at you know, these nice houses. Uh, the locals would, would house us. And the person who housed me was very, very wealthy. Uh, the house was basically an art museum. And so my guest bathroom had this little soap uh, holder that was uh, like, a, like a, a marble pyramid with a long wire cantilevered over it. And on the bottom of it was a, a magnet uh, that attached to, uh, that, that stuck itself into a bar of soap. So it just hung there beautifully and elegantly. And I thought, oh, I have to get one of these. So I go up and look at it online. And of course it's from a museum gift shop and it was like 200 or $300. <laughs> <laughs> and I, so I typed in, you know, magnetic soap holder uh, on eBay to see what might pop up. Sure enough, they make these things in Asia. Uh, that and this one costs now a dollar seventy nine. Uh, you order from Shanghai, it takes about three weeks. There's the shipping's included, but a dollar seventy nine. You really can't beat this. And so that is the so beauty awesome. Of this thing is that it's just a cheap little, uh, you know, uh, stainless steel looking uh, gizmo. It's got an adhesive on it, so you stick it to the to the wall uh, next to your sink, and it's got a little uh, uh, metal disc. Um, attached to a magnet, kind of like a, a soda bottle cap, right? And you shove that soda bottle cap type looking thing into your bar of nice soap. And so your soap will then hang from this magnet. Uh, and, 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 you know, no more dissolving soap bars in your soap dish. Um, if you like to buy like fancy Neutrogena or these really nice soaps that just turn to <laughs> mush the moment you, you uh -huh. put it in the dish, uh, this has saved me so many bars of soap. Huh. Uh, and 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 the and the, the, main, the 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 cap the little cap that you press into it that doesn't pull out uh, very easily once you put it in because that's what what I would expect to happen with the magnet is when you pull it yeah, off. Yeah, so the, the first thing you do is you uh, kind of uh, soften the soap a little uh -huh. bit, uh, you know, for a few minutes under underwater. Uh -huh. uh, then you push the cap into it and just let it sit overnight until it hardens up, uh -huh. and you'll get a very good seal on it. Uh, it generally won't okay. come off, but you can always just stick it back in there. Right, right. I love cool. it. So I, I just bought it, and uh, it's <laughs> coming on May 27th, so it'll take a while. <laughs> get a couple, because they're great little housewarming gifts. <laughs> yeah, you're right. I should get a couple. $1.96 was the total, including shipping. So <laughs> how, how can I... How can I complain about that? I'm looking forward to that. That's great. I love it. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I actually prefer bar soap to the the uh, liquid stuff. I think it's a yeah. millennial thing. Millennials yeah. are supposedly like they're, they're liquid, but uh -huh. give me a bar anytime. Yeah, proper soap bar anytime. You know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, here's another interesting one. Um, uh, a self-cleaning cat litter box. That, that sounds pretty cheap. cool. So it's not one of these like, yeah. you know, a $400 electric operated things that scoop your litter automatically. No, no, no. This is $36.99. 
Uh, it's called the Omega Paw Roll and Clean Self-Cleaning Litter Box. Uh, and it's, it's a little bit hard to describe, but, but let me try to explain. So imagine kind of a box-shaped uh, litter box with a round opening uh, mm -hmm. that your cat goes into. And the bottom uh, quad quadrant of this, this box has a grill uh, around it. And the grill allows the clean litter not that hasn't been clumped up uh, to fall through. And, and it's the clean litter is trapped in a reservoir. And so when you tilt this box 90 degrees, or a little over 90 degrees, uh, all the clumps of litter fall and roll over that grill and into a pull-out tray that sits on top of the grill. So literally, it takes me about eight or nine seconds every morning to clean my litter box for two cats. Right, uh, and our friends can't believe it, and then I show them that it literally takes less than 10 seconds to clean a litter box because for so many years, every morning I had the same ritual. You know, you sit there with your little scoop thing and try to scoop out the little golden nuggets, and for years I was convinced my cats believed that the only reason I kept them around was that their purpose in life was to produce these magical golden nuggets that were so <laughs> valuable because I spent every morning mining for them. <laughs> so they thought they were doing their duty, so to speak. <laughs> oh, wow. And, so the, and, the, and the cats don't have any trouble using it. They, 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 they get it. They, get, they don't mind going to a little uh, cave not at to all. do it. No, not at all. Uh, and in fact, you can watch this on, on YouTube. Just look up Omega Paw, mm -hmm. um, and you can watch the rolling effect. It's literally less than 10 seconds. You know, it's, it's uh, mm -hmm. whoever invented this deserves a Nobel Prize. <laughs> this is so cool. I love it. I, I, actually, I actually tried to buy this, but it said that the uh, eBay seller is currently on vacation. So I'm, I'm bookmarking this. Uh, you can get okay. it on Amazon as well, uh, I think. Okay, I'll take a look. So that that's really cool. And and. Do you find that it does like it gets all of the the nuggets? Uh, yeah, just about about ninety percent. Um, mm -hmm. So it's got a hard plastic bottom that you don't need a, a you know plastic liners or anything. Mm -hmm. And so when you invert the box ninety plus degrees, just give it a tap on the bottom, and whatever clumps uh, that are formed that are stuck to the bottom will will fall off and roll into right. the pull That's out so tray. Cool. And how and many cats do you have? Two. Two. Okay. <laughs> We have three, so it's like a twice a day deal for me. And yeah, I see, I see um, the Omega Paw Premium, and I'm wondering if you have any opinions about the uh, about oh, the that premium. There's premium, and then there's another version. Whether there, whether again, it makes any difference. Premium oh, is it now. I think it might be a little bit bigger. I'm not oh, it's sure. Bigger, I guess if you have a big cat, maybe okay. Yeah, or, or multiple cats. It's, it features a stronger, more durable. Sifting great, stronger locking clips, chrome accents. There you go. That's what you're paying for. Those beautiful yeah. chrome accents. Get chrome bumpers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and an integrated litter step. Oh, and it has a little like a step to to help uh, uh okay. maybe older cats hop. That that might be actually something we have an older cat, so that would be a good one to get. Well, uh, okay. My, my cat is Fidel Castro, so he doesn't want anything that bourgeois. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um, all right. Well, we are on a roll here, and and I see you are like you're you're an eBay kind of kind of guy. Um, you you like oh this is something I've actually been looking at and and wanting to hear someone tell me about it. it it's these uh, LED garage uh, work lights. Yeah, they're fantastic. They're incredibly bright, um, and they're very cheap. Uh, and it's kind of hard to describe. It's a deformable. They're called deformable LED lights. That's what you would search for. Mm -hmm. And they come in a range, uh, you know, as low as uh, forty watts uh, up to two hundred, three hundred watts. Uh, and you can use them for wide open areas like garages. You can use them as grow lamps if you're into indoor gardening mm -hmm. uh, or uh, just you know, flooding the room with just really soft, bright light. Uh, and there are two types there. They, they, it, it's a, like a regular uh, floodlight type of thing, except it's got these little pan four, three or four panels that fold like, out. Kind like of like wings a, almost. They're like wings. Like a or, wing. Yeah. yeah. Or propeller. And on those wings, like a, like a overhead ceiling fan kind of right. arrangement. Right. And so on those blades are the LED uh, diodes. Uh, and sometimes they're they're bare, so they're incredibly bright and a little bit blinding if you're going to use it for you know in you know a uh, living room type of situation. Uh, but some of them also come with a uh, white uh, translucent cover, so it softens the light. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I love these things because you can adjust each of the the flower petals, the fan blades, 
uh, at different angles. Um, so if you oh, have a cool. hard to light uh, nook or something like that, you could really mm-hmm. uh, have some fun uh, with this. Oh, nice! And and they have they seem to be do they have like a they have like a standard light bulb screw base? Is that what they're doing? They're screwing into a normal socket. Exactly. So it's a standard E twenty six or E twenty seven socket. Mm-hmm. And it'll work both in the U.S. and Europe. Uh, and the price range is anywhere from ten bucks to forty bucks. Uh, but Depending. I always order mine straight from from China because it's mm-hmm. a lot cheaper that way. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah, and, the way- and the more expensive ones are presumably more powerful, have brighter. Yes. Right? Uh-huh. The advantage of this over, say, like the strips, the long strips, is that you have more control. You can kind of um, it's more of a spotlight in that sense. Yeah, uh, a spotlight or or floodlight, depending on how you position yeah. the uh, the blades. Uh, but yeah, it's it's far more directional, and I think just brighter in general. And how many do you have set up in your in your garage or, or workroom, Sanho? Do you have just one, or I have one for the plants, and then I have one in my living room. Mm-hmm. Oh, in your yeah. living room, because I like to use reflected indirect light, so mm-hmm. I shine it towards the ceiling, and it just gives me soft light throughout the room. Oh, cool! Yeah, you can put it like in like a lamp stand, just pointing up to the ceiling. Yeah, yeah. So uh, those blades will rotate. 180 degrees uh well like more like 90 degrees you can mm-hmm. get good good angles from them. there are two types of these blades some that fold upwards and some fold downwards so you just uh, want to make sure you get the right one for your, got your it. Oh, okay i i am seeing it now i i, I see uh, what you mean the ones that fold downwards um the light is coming from the outside so if you fold them all the way up they're going to be hitting the ceiling yeah Okay, so that's important to note is to see the uh, orientation of the blades. Hmm. Yeah, I like the idea of using them as a, as a kind of a living room lamp, very avant-garde ish, uh, projected onto the ceiling. Yeah, you're right. Mm-hmm. That's kind of indirect lighting. Yeah, really nice. <laughs> okay, you're you're costing me some, and, some and, money. Uh, here. Are there only one color? Are they all the the daylight or uh, they have daylight and warm light as well? Okay. Very cool. cool. And are these okay. just, just uh, Chineseium, just a Chinese OEM? Or are they, are there, there's no brand, I don't think. Yeah, they're hard to find in the U.S. I, yeah. I don't see them at Home Depot or anywhere else okay. these days yet. But uh, yeah, there are a lot of Chinese OB, OEMs. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, now, this, this final pick of yours is something that I am familiar with, and uh, I really like it. Why don't you tell us about this, uh, this scale? So it's just a, a you know a tiny little digital uh, luggage scale, and you know for years I used to use this one I bought like twenty years ago, uh, and it was the size of a brick literally, and it used a bunch of AA batteries and it weighed about a pound, so it's not something you want to take with you inside your luggage, mm-hmm. but now they have these tiny ones that literally fit in the palm of your hand, uh, and it weighs just a, an ounce or two, and it's powered by a button battery the size of a quarter. Uh, and best of all, uh, you can get it for two dollars and ninety six cents, <laughs> uh, which includes shipping. You're going to break <laughs> so our bank on this one. Here. <laughs> <laughs> now it's going to take two or three weeks to arrive because you're ordering it from China. But still, two dollars and ninety six cents is a pretty good price. They're so cheap that I put one of these in each of my my suitcases, so I always have it when I travel, and I never have to pay the baggage fees again. You know? mm-hmm. That's really wow. nice. And 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 um, is it switchable between kilograms and pounds? Yes, very easy. Yeah, and it comes with a a, a strap that you uh, and it's got a little bayonet clip, uh, and you put it around your luggage handle so you can lift up the luggage and weigh it that way. But you can also weigh lots of other things. So uh, if I need to weigh my cats, for instance, to see how they're growing, uh-huh. I'll put them in a you know a shopping bag, a paper bag, and then <laughs> use that to to lift them up and <laughs> voila. Yeah, that's wow. really cool. Yeah, okay. I've done that for packages too, where <laughs> I, I'm mailing something mm-hmm. and I'll just put it into a big plastic bag and then yeah. use this you, thing. You use it like, it's, yeah, instead of having a scale. This yeah. is really cool. It comes in really handy. Right. So, so, so this is really cool. And, you know, uh, all, all four of your suggestions, Sano, are from eBay. Maybe you're an eBay power user. Do you have any tips about how you're finding these things on eBay or, or, using eBay in general that you would want to pass on? Yeah, um, I really like eBay, and I just don't like giving Jeff Bezos any money. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> but also, a lot of these things now have free shipping, right? So, yeah, uh, especially if you're ordering from China. 
So basically anything that fits into a small package, it's it's usually include has free shipping these days. Right. And you're paying about a quarter to a third of the price you might pay for the same item once right. it reaches the United States and goes through a third party and they put their their markup on it. Right. Um and and have so, you yeah. tried like AliExpress or you know Alibaba in terms of if if you're interested in kind of direct shipments from China, um, do you find eBay is better than than AliExpress or Alibaba? I haven't used I haven't ordered from AliExpress. I sometimes I I look at their their Twitter feed just for ideas of neat gadgets uh -huh. and things, but then I'll look up the same thing on on eBay. I uh, see. These, you know these vendors often you know market on different platforms. Uh -huh. Oh, so so wait, th that sounds interesting. AliExpress has a Twitter feed that shows interesting things, interesting yeah. finds. Yeah. Oh wow, yeah. that that yeah. sounds a little uh, dangerous, actually. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Very cool, though. I'm going to check that out. Uh -huh. um, and do you sell things on eBay? I don't. Uh, I just so don't have the discipline to, you know. Right. So <laughs> for you, it's just, it's, this is mostly an alternative to Amazon, then. Yeah. Yeah. Basically. But it's okay. also a lot cheaper because you're not. Uh, yeah. Uh, sometimes you know you're you're buying from a small uh, dealer who doesn't have a whole lot of overhead, uh, and they're just uh -huh. dealing from their garage, um, so you can get it for for pretty cheap. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That sounds good. So so the the uh, Twitter feed is uh, for AliExpress official is AliExpress underscore e n because if you just do the regular AliExpress, it's, it takes you to AliExpress Russia. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, I, I just like the you know the the ease of eBay in terms of customer support, and if there's disputes or something, it's uh -huh. you know it's a pretty straightforward process. Yeah, sure, sure. Okay, this is cool. this is really cool. Um, so so Sanha, uh, we met like I said at a conference of World Affairs in Boulder, and uh, uh, we were on a, a few different panels together. Um, I, I was really interested in your work, and and. Uh, I would love to hear your work in in uh, you know drug policy. It's been over twenty years that you've been doing this. Um, are you encouraged by the direction you've seen uh, towards uh, looking at at uh, drugs as a kind of a, a public health issue rather than a criminal issue? Yeah, it's been we've made tremendous progress, particularly in in this hemisphere and in, in Europe as well. Uh, other parts of the world, not so much. <laughs> They're going the opposite mm -hmm. direction. Right. And so that's a lot of what I'm working on now is situations like the Philippines, where mm -hmm. President Duterte, who was kind of a Trumpian figure in the Philippines, he, he got elected six months before Trump, um, using the same kind of you know audacious lies and intimidation and threats. And, uh, and he's behaving like a despot, basically. Uh, but he campaigned on the promise of killing uh, he said, you know, Hitler killed three million Jews, which is incorrect, six, mm -hmm. like six million. But he says, I would be happy to kill three million Filipinos um, to wage his drug war. Whoa. And uh, he said he campaigned on the idea that you know, Manila, the, the fish in Manila Bay would grow fat from all the corpses he would throw into the into the bay of drug users. Uh, and, you know, his official spokespeople say, oh, he's, he, that's just, don't take him literally, you know, take him figuratively. But he has been doing that. So. Uh, the Commission on Human Rights, uh, an independent uh, governmental body in the Philippines, estimates the death toll could be as high as 27,000. Uh, I've seen even higher by some estimates, but we'll never know because the police won't investigate a lot of these uh, killings, or they say there's, in, you know, they don't have enough evidence. Uh, so they're listed as just uh, extrajudicial killings hmm. or, or, or uh, just murders. Right. But a lot of this is being done by the police or their paid henchmen and their hit squads. So they're coming up with death lists, watch lists of people they suspect of using drugs uh, and, you know, making threats against them. And eventually they'll send a death squad or, or you know, hitmen uh, after them. Why would it be in Duterte's interest to do this? So he is a classic authoritarian, uh, tough guy, kind of like Trump, kind of like uh, President Bolsonaro in Brazil, mm -hmm. another basically a fascist. Uh, and he uh, is using this as a modern day pogrom. Uh, if you can think back to 19th century uh, czarist Russia, right, when they waged pogroms against Jews, it was a simple way to, to scapegoat one sector of the population. And you take a cornucopia of social ills, 
uh, many of which are structural in nature, poverty, neglect, abandonment by the state, uh, despair, alienation. And you take all that stuff and you thrust it onto one uh, demographic group and say, they're the problem. If you just unleash holy hell on them, get rid of them, kill them, do whatever you want to them. Uh, we won't bother you if you if you do that. And, and Duterte, is, Duterte has actually said this. You know, um, if you know a drug user, just pick up a gun. I won't I won't prosecute you. Uh, oh my God! And so it's an exterminationist ideology, uh, but it's one that can be used to persecute all kinds of different uh, groups within within a country. So right now, the easy easiest prey are drug users because they've been so thoroughly dehumanized uh, under his administration. Uh, but you could turn that once you have the apparatus to track individuals, to uh, you know locate them, uh, and to execute them without judicial uh, review, without due process. Once you condition your police to do that, you can turn that whole apparatus on the dime and go after labor organizers, LGBTQ orga organizers, feminists, anyone who gets in your way. Right. Uh -huh. uh, and that's what Duterte has done in the Philippines. He does the same thing uh, that Trump is doing in terms of waging a war against the judiciary, against the press, against everybody. Uh, so he silenced a lot of uh, his, his, his critics. Um, when Trump says lock her up, Duterte has actually done that to uh, opposition senators on trumped up charges for which there is no bail. And so they've been locked up for years awaiting trial on, on basically he's waging lawfare against them, alleging that they you know, misfiled a form or, or misspelled something in an application, whatever it takes, his judges will allow him to persecute these people. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's why it's so important to follow the Philippines, because it's uh, it gives you a sense of what, where Trump is headed and the blueprint of how to achieve those kinds of you know, nefarious goals. Do you, do you follow the kind of the, the drug world the, in the in the larger sense? Like, say, right now there's a little bit of a reevaluating of um, psychedelics and and yes. their roles in in the world. And is that sort of part of what you look at as well? Where, where, um, yeah. So, drug policy is one of the most interdisciplinary subjects I've ever worked on. Mm -hmm. And I was a World War II historian in a previous career, so that's pretty interdisciplinary. You know, how do you wage a world war? Uh, but the drug war is actually even more complicated than that because in World War II, there was a lot of clarity about which side you were on, right? And who the good mm -hmm. guys and bad guys were. Drug war is much more complicated, and the solutions are very often counterintuitive. Uh, and one of the areas that is most interesting right now is the breakthrough in, in psychedelic research that's been, you know, blessed by the DEA and, mm -hmm. and all these government agencies are allowing serious researchers to experiment with things that uh, were once, you know, Schedule One, uh, you know, demonized psychedelics, LSD, psilocybin mm -hmm. mushrooms, MDMA or ecstasy. 5 um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, these things were originally developed as therapeutic treatments, um, mm -hmm. in, you know, they used as medicine right. uh, until in the 60s. And, and, you know, he's got, you know, got wind of them and Nixon waged his war on drugs and that was that. But now we're finally able to re-explore uh, this technology that, that has been suppressed for so long and finding it has tremendous value, uh, particularly for people who are uh, confronting trauma, PTSD, uh, end-of-life anxieties. So mm -hmm. uh, some of the most interesting studies have been around psilocybin mushrooms and uh, late-stage cancer patients who mm -hmm. are facing death. Um, and they find that one dose of, of these mushrooms can have long lasting effects up to a year right. of, of, of a better feeling of tranquility and serenity and, and coming to peace with yourself and the universe. Right. Um, and there's the whole work with the five MEOs and others on the, um, the veterans coming back from war and, and very few treatments of them having helping with their post, you know, um, stress disorders yeah. as well. And um, so that's that's what so, so that's all the kind of the the the, the big view that you have, do, do and like and then you get into like the fentanyl and opioids as well. Is that part of what you're looking at? Yeah, fentanyl crisis, the overdose crisis we're facing, and things like the Trump Wall, for instance. I never thought I would have to spend a moment dealing with such an idiotic concept as the Trump mm -hmm. Wall, but here we are. <laughs> we have the longest government shutdown in history, thanks to the wall. Uh -huh. What uh, does the what does the wall do? Uh, in terms of of drug trafficking and uh, behavioral change around drugs, practically nothing, because the drugs are not coming through the desert. 
Um, it, it doesn't make sense for cartels to, you know, put their precious cargo on some uh, migrants who are carrying their worldly possessions on their back and and jugs of water to cross the desert. Mm-hmm. How many kilos of weed or, or you know, Matthew, you think they're able to carry uh, it reliably? Uh, these are not professional smugglers either. Uh, most of the drugs that come to this country come through our legal ports of entry. Right. They come in uh, hidden in semi, uh, you know, trailers. Uh, packed in all kinds of produce and canned goods and every nook and cranny. Um, a lot of it comes through narco tunnels that crisscross the U.S.-Mexican border. Uh, with it, They have very sophisticated rail systems, ventilation, electricity. Uh, they can move tons at a time. So the idea of moving a few kilos over vast stretches of desert, it, it makes no sense whatsoever. Do, do, you, but, do, you, do you have like a, um, a holistic drug policy that you would like to see implemented worldwide? Well, if, yes. <laughs> it, it, you know, first of it, uh, first of all, starting with decriminalization, it makes no sense to punish mm-hmm. users. If you believe that drugs cause harm to the individual, what sense does it make for the state to harm them even more by throwing them into prison, uh, you know, having them associate with violent people, ruining their job uh, prospects, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It just maximizes the harm. Uh, and I also believe in drug regulation, uh, that uh, prohibition doesn't mean we control drugs. It means we give up the right to control drugs. And therefore, the people who control this economy are, by definition, criminals and very often organized crime. They have a very different uh, set of objectives compared to uh, legal merchants of, uh, of drugs that we've legalized, like, like cannabis, for instance, right, or alcohol. Um, alcohol system works in this country because we give uh, private shopkeepers every incentive not to sell to minors, not to do illegal things because they'll lose their license, they'll be prosecuted, all manner of calamity will befall them. But when it comes to drugs, we have no such uh, you know, incentives. Um, and they think, well, if I'm going to risk doing this, I might as well risk, my, uh, you know, risk it for, for the highest profit available, right? maximize my profit. And so you don't want to smuggle, you know, 50% pure heroin. You want to smuggle 100% pure heroin. You want to, uh, it's kind of like alcohol prohibition turn a nation of beer drinkers and wine drinkers into a nation of hard liquor drinkers. <laughs> because if you were a bootlegger during prohibition, the last thing you wanted to smuggle was a keg of beer on your back. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. Okay. So, so, so there is, there is kind of a, a holistic um, policy that could, that, that, you know, um, with th- that's installable or exportable or whatever you want to call it, that is imp- implementable. Yes. Um, and wh- who is there any wh- is there any country that the or countries that actually have implemented it? They're part of it, and th- you would point to. Yes. So here's the daunting thing for most people. They think, well, we'll never find utopia, the perfect you know uh, uh, system. Uh, but in fact. Elements of that perfect system exist all over the world. It's a matter of assembling these pieces of the mosaic so people can understand how this might eventually fit into one coherent system. But if you look at, for instance, Portugal, uh, back in uh, two, 2000, they decided to, uh, they had a huge heroin crisis, a uh, serious addiction problem. They decided to end drug prohibition. Um, it, it, you could not get arrested for all uh, drug possession, for any drug possession. So uh-huh. personal use was was tolerated, was permitted. Uh, and they took those policing resources and put them in the social services, public health. They've had fantastic outcomes. If you looked at the, the Portuguese statistics blind compared to other EU nations, they're actually doing much better. And yet they have a completely radical approach to this. It, it, it's still not legal to, to traffic drugs uh, mm-hmm. and they don't have legal markets to, to buy these things, uh, which is I think the f- next step. But the fact that they're not arresting people and using, you know, a public health frame and a social service frame to approach this problem, I think, is is the right approach. Mm-hmm. Okay. Other countries like here, uh, like Switzerland uh, and Canada, allow prescription of of different pharmaceutical drugs for people mm-hmm. who have failed at all other treatment modalities. If they're going to continue to use opioids or other drugs, then it makes much more sense for the state to say, hey, we'd rather you didn't do this, but if you're going to, let us educate you. Let us give you a pure supply so you don't overdose based on contaminants and things. You don't know the purity of the drug. And you're not supporting organized crime or other 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 uh, cartels or, and such. 
so they figured out ways to short circuit a lot of the the harms uh, of mm -hmm. these things and try to minimize the harms. So that philosophy overall is called harm reduction, and it's one I support very much. Mm. Um, Sanho, if people want to find out more about your work at uh, the Institute for Policy Studies, especially regarding uh, the Drug Policy Project, where's the best place for them to go? They can go to my website, which is uh, ips-dc.org, and click on Drug Policy. Um, or you can follow me on Twitter, uh, which is at Sanho Tree is my handle. Yeah, and I, I, let me just say, everyone listening, you you must follow Sanho's Twitter. It's <laughs> it's awesome. <You're> very kind. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, it's so good. Well, Sanho, this has been really great talking to you. Um, great reconnecting after all of these years, and uh, you're doing excellent work, and you are uh, an eBay expert. So uh, <laughs> thanks so much for yeah, for it was a great great us. finds. I really appreciate your sensibility too. Yeah, the um, the idea of um, direct imports from China, that's all Real, well and good. Thank you for the suggestions. Hey, everybody, it's your co-host, Mark, and I wanted to let you know that we have a lot more going on here in Cool Tools than just this podcast. We have our flagship website where we review a new tool every day. That's at cool-tools.org. We also have four different newsletters. We have this podcast. We have a YouTube channel where we review tools. And if you like what you hear and see and read, the best way to help us out is by going to our Patreon page at patreon.com slash cool tools and donate at any level you wish. You can even contribute $1 a month, and, and that would mean a lot to us. The money that you give us will go towards paying for our transcribing costs, editing videos, and editing the podcast. It goes towards paying contributors who write the reviews for us. It goes towards our equipment costs, our hosting costs, and it supports our very small company of three people. This week, I wanted to give a shout out to some of our Patreon supporters who have been giving us at least $2 a month. And if you give us $2 a month, we'll give you a shout out online. And this week, I would like to thank Michael Sakochia, Molly Starr, M. Velderman, Opposable Thumbs, Pamela Cooley, Patrick Weyer, Paul Hosey, Randy Fisher, Stuart Burroughs Brand, Synaptic Sam, Therese Schwartz, Tom Hawkins, Tom Markham, What Bear, Javier Pangolin, David Lang, Eric Byers, Sean Hartley, Stephen Powell, Greg Lichtscheidt, John Hobson, Adam Bristol, Adam Naher, Anonymous, Bill Kempthorne, Bruce I. Niles, Chris Woodruff, C. Colos, Daryl Flynn, Egg Fliegoff, Eric Hanschrau, Eric Hoover, Godfrey Saldana, Jay Skiles, John M. Larson, Jude Galligan, Kenneth Gilman, and Lucas Frank. Thank you very much for supporting the show, and we will see you next week.